back at Live from the Lake House. Uh, right here, this afternoon segment, we're going to have a remote attendee. We're going to have someone coming in and joining us for an interview on Zoom. We're so excited to have him. He's uh, one of Databricks' top presenter types. He gets out there and shows us what's going on, and I love watching him on stage. And I just want to hand, him over, hand over to Holly now to introduce him. All right, so yeah, we have a really fantastic guest. Uh, we have Michael Armbrust, who is one of the, uh, uh, no, distinguished, distinguished engineers. Uh, Datarix <laughs> has been here pretty much as long as the company has been around. Absolutely, um, uh, you know, foundational kind of contributor to everything that goes on here at Datarix. So I'd like to welcome Michael. Hello, hello. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. I understand you've been a bit under the weather, and that's why you've not been here in person. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you for not spreading germs around. Um, but second <laughs> of all, uh, for taking the time out of your day, out of your recovery, to speak to us. So, um, But have you been watching at home? Absolutely, yeah. I've been really sad to miss the summit. So I watched all the live streams this morning, um, and it's great to get included in this way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, highlights for you so far? Um, yeah, so you know, I'm, I, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but I'm particularly excited about Lakeflow. I thought that was really exciting. Also, all the cool stuff that Reynolds talked about that's coming in Spark 4.0, I thought was pretty cool. Um, and of course, Delta is near and dear to my heart. So Absolutely. So let's spend some time talking about Lakeflow. And first of all, I noticed that that came out uh, with TechCrunch yesterday, but we didn't really start talking about it until today. Uh, but given that this is so new to people and people at home might not know what Lakeflow is, could you give us a bit of an introduction about uh, what it is and you know why is it something that we want to build at Databricks? Yeah, so Lakeflow is the next evolution of our data engineering offering at Databricks. It's the evolution of what used to be called workflows and Delta Live tables, as well as we've mixed in um, a bunch of pretty cool technology from this company, Archeon, that we acquired earlier this year. Yeah, so hearing that Archeon piece, that was very interesting for me. So um, again, this was another acquisition that happened, oh gosh, how many months ago? Was this a year ago? It's not yeah, even it year. Yeah, it was almost a year ago, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. It was very hot. Um, and so this is around kind of um, not just ingestion, but kind of connecting to different sources and being able to bring everything together kind of in one lake house. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how that integration has gone? Uh, you know, how much progress has been made? Or any bumps that kind of happened along the way? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, Lakeflow is broken into kind of three different pieces. Yes. Ingestion, transformation and orchestration. And we'll start off with ingestion because that's kind of where the Archeon technology is making the biggest impact. So Archeon had this really cool trick where um, they could actually understand the change logs of different databases. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine you've got something like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, any of these different systems, uh, and you want to replicate them into your data lakes or into your lake house so that you can query, so you can do large scale analytics without compromising the latency and other operations on this kind of very important operational system. Now, you could just dump that entire database every single day, but that's obviously going to have to be very expensive and have huge impacts on the database itself. So what Archeon does is instead, they can actually read the transaction log from these uh -huh. systems and see only the data that is changing. And this is a perfect match for the technology we have inside of Delta Live tables uh, with this pretty cool trick we have called apply changes into, which yes. takes a change feed and applies it into a Delta table. And so what we've done is we've kind of married these two pieces together and we've built a point and click ingestion UI. So now it is possible to bring data in from any of these different data sources just by clicking buttons in the UI. You say you authenticate using Unity Catalog and put your credentials in. You pick the source tables or schemas or entire catalogs that you want to ingest. You pick a destination in Unity Catalog and it automatically creates a, uh, you know, a low latency incremental ETL pipeline that will bring all of that data in. You know, it works not only for operational stores like databases, but also for SaaS services like Salesforce or Marketo, pretty much any of these different services you might have data in. Honestly, this is such a great feature for me to hear. Uh, I did a project maybe, oh gosh, a year ago, and we wanted to be able to ingest something almost near real time from a, a MySQL database. It was not really the kind of design I knew in kind of 18 months they'd be redoing it anyway. So I kind of had to like it or lump it, to be honest. And, um, you know, even 
even if they did have the ability to turn on CDC on their side, the team didn't want to do it. They were worried about the amount of data it would be making. Um, and then also, from our perspective, it was kind of like the, the manual overhead of figuring out, or just kind of guessing what was new, having to bring in the guest new stuff, and then try and like figure out all the deduplication on the data break side, and then trying to make all of this happen real time. Um, it was very clear at that moment that this is a now solution. It is not a forever solution. <laughs> so uh, it's really great to hear that Lakeflow um, is able to do this. And you, uh, there, there must be some people who have test driven this already. Do you have any stories to, to share? Um, yeah, I mean, so we, we, we've actually got a couple of people using the private preview already. I think, uh, and in fact, that would be my call to action for everybody. If you've got data in SQL Server in the cloud, or if you've got data in Salesforce, we're going into private preview for both of those connectors today. So sign up and you can, you can try it out. Um, and yeah, we've, we've, uh, what we've actually been doing right now is we've been stress testing the system. And I think one of my favorite stories here is the, uh, I think the Archeon team was pleasantly surprised with just how efficient the DLT ingestion was. Nice. <laughs> they were worried that they were going to tip us over, and uh, we were able to handle the data they were sending at us with no problem. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. So the ingestion, that's kind of one third of lake flow. What's next? Yeah, so after you get the data in, you know, kind of your bronze layer, the next part is transformations. And this is where what we're doing is we're bringing the technology from Delta Live Tables, but really integrating it into a kind of a single holistic experience with Databricks workflows. So I don't know if you saw the demo this morning, but if you did, what I think one of my favorite things was being able to see that unified DAG, where I could see my different pipelines, but then also without having the context switch, go into an individual pipeline and see the streaming tables and materialized views that are in it. Those are the kind of the two key concepts in, inside of uh, a, a, a lake flow pipeline is a streaming table, which is great for doing simple transformations or ingestion from any of these different data sources that you might, you know, you might not be using the connectors for. So if you've got Autoloader, you've got Kafka, you've got Kinesis, you can use all that kind of stuff there. And then materialized views are the easiest way to do transformations. You write SQL and we will automatically create a Delta table that contains the results of that SQL query and incrementally keep it up to date. Uh, so my understanding is that's done today with Enzyme? That's right. Enzyme is the next evolution of the Catalyst query optimizer, which is kind of what powers Spark SQL. Um, <laughs> Catalyst allows us to understand query plans and to rewrite them. And that's what actually makes Spark SQL so fast. And what Enzyme brings to Catalyst is the ability to also understand the Delta transaction log. So you can kind of hear it in the name Delta. The, the reason we called it that is because what it's actually recording is it's not recording the entire table at each different commit. It's recording the changes to that table. Mm. And that's where Enzyme comes in. It looks at only the data that is changing and then figures out how to propagate those changes through the system. And the best part is it has a couple of different techniques that it can use to do this. In some cases, if you're making a big change, it actually turns out fully recomputing is the most efficient way to do it. If you've got a table that is partitioned, it might be efficient to, uh, you know, perhaps by date, it's often the most efficient thing to just overwrite the individual dates that have changed. And then it'll even do kind of the most advanced thing, which is kind of calculate what I would consider like the derivative of the query, what rows are changing, and then merge those changes into the final table. And it's dynamically deciding in real time which strategy it's going to use so that you get the most up-to-date data at the lowest price. Uh this is, first of all, amazing to hear. But second of all, I want to tell a funny uh, Databricks story about how we use our own internal data and how we're going to benefit from this. <laughs> so from my accent, you can probably tell I'm in London. I'm a different time zone by about eight hours. And if you're trying to look at Salesforce data, I'm not sure it's true now, but very much in the early days, we'd only ever extract data once a day. And so you would have to then kind of like time everything to be like, oh, well, what time did the extract happen? And like, again, it's always very much snapshots of these things that happened. Um, and it was always just like one big bulk load each time rather than being able to say, oh, OK, I know these changes did happen in the front end, but they're not going to come through until tomorrow. But with something like this, that's going to make it a lot easier to be able to incrementally do these things and have, frankly, a much more sensible representation of our data, to be honest. <laughs> that's exactly right. And then after you get the data in, you know, transformed in your pipelines, the next step in Lakeflow is orchestration. Yes. This is all of the kind of cool technology that we built in Databricks workflows and have now brought into this unified product. So whether you're going to train a model next or whether you're going to refresh a dashboard, kick off a DBT job, whatever it is, uh, workflows can orchestrate. 
that that kind of all together in one place. The other big thing that we're going to be working on here is the ability. To, I think a kind of key part of orchestration is not only that it's running regularly, but that you have the observability to confirm that it's running, it's meeting your SLAs, it's producing good data, you're staying within budget. And so another kind of key part of this is this unified observability service that shows you everything that's happening inside of your Databricks workspace and lets you see what's working, what's not working, so you can zero in and fix those things that are broken. So one of the words that you used there was budget. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Because that's been not that transparent previously in the platform, and I'd love to hear more about it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So this is, you know, I think one of the coolest things we've rolled out in the last year is system tables in Unity Catalog. And so these are tables that are automatically created by Databricks. And in fact, we use Databricks to populate them under the covers. Um, <laughs> and one of the one of the coolest ones is the, the billing usage table. And so this will actually show you every dollar DBU that you are spending on the platform, and it'll break it down into individual workloads. And we're working on the ability to also kind of tag those workloads that you can do chargebacks by department or by user or by workload, project, all that kind of stuff. And the cool thing is, since it's all available in a Delta table inside of your workspace, you have all of the power of Databricks SQL and uh, you know, AI BI dashboards to visualize and understand exactly where the money is going so you can make sure you're using that limited budget in the most effective way. Absolutely. I think. Again, some of the earlier days, some of the big projects that I got involved with, kind of like, oh, how do we do like a chargeback model? And it used to be like a fairly blunt solution of just kind of like, oh, just have lots of different workspaces, and you know, you know, where where do you really need to collaborate on these things? Uh, and this is going to really allow people to work together, uh, not enforce those silos from kind of chargebacks, but then be able to dynamically, you know, say, oh, well, Holly, she spent up a 100 node cluster. You got to pay for it. That's got to come out of your budget. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's great to hear. That's right. Yeah. And I think that just in general, Unity Catalog has been great at breaking down these silos between workspaces, both for your own data and for the data about how the platform is operating. Yes. And then what's great is that, like, Nothing goes missing. There are no sneaky secret workspaces that are going on because they're all linked. So you can see what is going on, and you can see who has set up a test workspace and then completely forgotten about it. So uh, that is another surprising benefit of Unity Catalog, which is not often espoused, but it's quite niche. So you know. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, Let me asking. I was I was curious. Uh, one of the things I heard in the context of the lake flow pipeline and the ingestion was this, this bit that sort of ties into the way that Delta Live tables is getting updated as well. And it's like essentially like it's, it's the next iteration of that. And of course, coming from the AI side, I think a little bit more about the RAG use cases and all of those things. And is the part that automatically updates like a vector search index also going to automatically be able to pick up that goodness? Is, is, that, is that something that we get for free along with the ride with everything else like flow? Uh, yeah, definitely. So yeah, so for those of you who don't know, we, we actually use the technology in Delta Live tables kind of all over the platform. Like I said, the power system tables, but it's also the thing that we use to replicate data from Delta into our vector search index or our online tables. Um, and yeah, absolutely, all the improvements that we continue to make to lake flow pipelines will automatically be seen by these other services that are built. And this does lead to a very interesting phenomenon, actually. So we have lots of internal Slack channels about different products and things like that. So for Delta Live Tables, Michael's in there a lot. I'm also in there a lot. And we get to see not just like customer questions come through, but someone from engineering saying, I'm trying to make it do this very advanced thing. I wanted to do this specific thing. How can I do it? And it's really great to see. like. It really is kind of properly battle tested at scale um, because we do have our own internal teams using it. And yeah, they really do push it to its limits. So I don't know if you can talk about this. Are there any kind of features that got tweaked or made because of an internal demand that we needed? <laughs> oh, sorry, is this a spicy question? <laughs> no, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, you know, actually, the, the first version of DLT, we had a bunch of internal people use it. This was like a very early prototype before it was called Delta Live Tables or any of that kind of stuff. And really what we learned um, was the engineering team that used it first, they, they broke all the rules. They <laughs> reached outside of the framework. They created <laughs> their own threads. They like modified the tables directly. Um, and as a result, we uh, and they broke a bunch of things. <laughs> oh. And we actually ended up spending quite a bit of time on isolation primitives after that before releasing it to the 
<laughs> oh, I think I remember that. I'm pretty sure there was a team. So for context, uh, Delta Live Tables, it works in Python and it works in SQL. I'm pretty sure I saw one team. They're like, anyway, so we tried to reverse engineer it to make it work in Scala, and now it doesn't do this thing properly. <laughs> like, well, we will in Scala, but we got to get those isolation primitives in place first. <laughs> Uh, oh, excellent. That is something I did not know that we were working on at the moment. Uh, so in yeah. terms of, I know, sorry, I know we've just talked about all of the new things that it is doing, uh, but in terms of kind of aspiration and roadmap and things that we are looking to do in the future, is there anything, you any tidbits that you can give us about what's coming next? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things I'm most excited about, um, that, you know, I think we talked about in the, the Delta Live Tables talk, if you're able to attend it at, at Summit, uh, is the new Flows API. And so, up until now, DLT has been great for doing like fairly simple transformations where you're reading from one delta table and writing to another delta table. But we really want to unlock the full power of structured streaming, which is actually one of the enabling te technologies that DLT has been built on top of. And we're doing this through the Flows API and the Syncs API. So now you can actually kind of a, a flow. The, the right way to think about this is, you know, DLT is a data flow graph. It's like data moving from different places, and flows are the edges of this graph. It's data coming from one place and moving to another place. And when you say something like create streaming table, what you're actually doing is you're creating a table and a flow. It's like shorthand for that. With the flows API, you can now have fine-grained control here. You can have multiple flows all writing into the same table. You can even read from Kafka and write directly to Kafka. And the reason that's so exciting is because the structured streaming team hasn't been sitting still. They've also been developing some pretty cool things. We just announced real-time mode, which allows you to run structured streaming queries with milliseconds end-to-end -end latency. And so now your DLT pipeline can also read from Kafka and write to Ka Kafka in tens of milliseconds, which is pretty exciting. Is this also part of the, the light speed improvements that have been going on at the moment? That's right, yeah. So this this was kind of code name Lightspeed and is now product name real time mode. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. No, oh, that's okay. No, that's good to connect it to the name we were using at the last summit. <laughs> ah, okay then. Yeah, there have been some fantastic things. It's kind of been broken down into uh, the kind of stateful and the stateless streaming, hasn't it? Yeah, that's absolutely right. They're, so they, they started by speeding up stateless streaming, which is a little bit easier of a problem. And basically the way that real time mode works is you know one of the coolest things about Spark and the way structured streaming works is you can run many different streams on the same cluster and they all share those resources. But there's of course a cost to rescheduling different uh, queries onto different slots at all time. And so what real time mode does is it actually reserves capacity for that stream so that it has access to that slot at all times and can forward data on to the next hop in the pipeline without any delays in scheduling, which is pretty cool. Okay, then. Wonderful. So thank you, Michael, uh, for di dialing in with us today. I appreciate uh, this is a lot to ask for someone who is not particularly well at the moment. So we really appreciate it. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Thank you um, so much. If people do want to get started, I know you said there's a preview to get started. Uh, is there anything else people should know to get started uh, with, with this? No, definitely sign up for the, the private preview of uh, Lake House Connectors and, you know, use, uh, use DLT to create some pipelines. <laughs> All right. Thank you so Brilliant. much. It's been an absolute pleasure. We will let you get back to your rest. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank Michael. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. Up next, uh, we are going to continue talking about uh, still data engineering. -y it's things. still data engineering, <laughs> uh, but a slightly different context. And for that, uh, we have Franco Pitano uh, to come and join us. Um, Welcome, Franco. Hello, hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to see you Good again. See you, I think we spoke last year. Um, happy to have you here again. Um, how's Summit been for you this year? <sighs> amazing. <laughs> Just utterly amazing. Too much. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Just much too much. Just everything. Like everything I wanted for Christmas. Fantastic. Yeah. What, what's, uh, what's, what's the best thing on your mind, top thing on your mind from the releases that have come out? Uh, we open sourced Unity Catalog, not in 90 days, not in 89 days, but uh, on the stage live in front of uh, the audience. I thought that that was epic. Just uh, well done, well orchestrated. No doubt. Uh, no doubt something else that was spoken about as well uh, was a lot of the kind of data warehousing improvements that have been made uh, over the last year or so. Um, I know that you spend a lot of your time talking about this. So do you want to give us a bit of a rundown of like your highlights in this area? There has been so much 
engineering brilliance put into the product, and it's not even done yet. Uh, I think the big kind of mic drop moment was uh, we saved, like this isn't a benchmark, but actual customer queries month to month. They got 73% better over the past two years. And that just goes to show you like the effort that our team has been putting in. Uh, not only were we the best two years ago, but it's gotten even better. And between us, there's more on the table coming later this year. So it's just super exciting. And not only is it performant, but it's super simple. Now we have all these natural language interfaces with the assistant and with text to in the dashboard and now these data rooms, AIBI, I think we're calling them. It's, uh, it's fantastic, it's simple to use, it's easy to navigate, and it's performant. It's kind of, you know, have your cake and eat it too, so it's, it's amazing. Absolutely, and for me, that performance improvement was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think when I uh, joined, you know, it, Databricks was known for very big data and kind of big data projects, but if it, was, if it was smaller, then, you know, oh, maybe you might want to use something else, but I just don't think that's the case at all anymore and being able to watch that performance and even just me kind of you know messing around in notebooks and kind of writing some code seeing things just happen so quickly it's, oh wow i didn't expect it to be that quick and i'm often surprised by it but you are you are much closer to it so you know do you have any customer stories about performance people have been able to get actually i do did i do we oh did i talk to you about this this is amazing I <laughs> actually uh, Monday, uh, my very first customer meeting was with uh, one of these, uh, one of our international customers that I had been talking to for a very long time. They're actually an early Databricks customer. Back when we used to call the product SQL Analytics, we actually, because uh, they were a very early adopter, we gave them a sweetheart deal on that product. And our serverless product now has to overcome that sweetheart deal of a discount. And it's been a struggle. <laughs> to tell you the least, but my engineers, especially Shant, has been telling me, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, like all last year. And the beginning of this year, uh, our product and engineering teams leaned in from like January to March. We basically evaluated our new serverless SQL offering and on Unity catalog, so they fully upgraded everything. And they were testing from January to March, and then they were validating uh, all summer, like from March until now. And they presented to me Today. It was amazing. Ooh. They're like, we want to, they, I come into this meeting and they're like, well, we want to present to you how awesome Databricks has made us look internally. And I was like, well, please do tell. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, he showed that he was able to reduce their costs by about 44%. I love the way they measured it. It's cost per user per day. This is a very high scale customer. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard, I actually didn't know how big they were until I was talking to someone from their country. Turns out the entire country uses their product. Like every day, it's a financial services product. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea the scale, but they, they, they cost, the uh, Databricks cost them, all their users, about $8,500 per user per day. And they were, able to, they were able to reduce that to about $4,800 per user per day, so about, 44, it was 44%, but about half, right? And then that's not the best part. Their queries got 6x faster. So they were able to deliver faster and cheaper. They were so excited because they looked, they looked great in front of their leadership I and mean, their users were so happy. What CFO doesn't want to hear, you know, this expensive tech team that, you know, has the potential to be a black hole of money is actually turning around and saying, hey, guess what? We've saved you a bunch of money. Exactly. Happy it days. Was, Fantastic. Uh, you know, of course, they did a little extra of engineering, of work, basically like a lot of extras to uh, control the costs that I think I was great. I had a PM with me in the meeting. He got a lot of notes about how they were actually engineering on top of Databricks SQL. So there's more to come. I, one, one thing I thought was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, they actually built automation with their, with their query history system table, if any query was, op was going longer than five minutes, he built automation with alerts to alert the user in Slack that your query is going over five minutes, you have five days to tag your query with the cost center that's responsible for this, who's paying, right? <laughs> if you do not, you're kicked out of Databricks. Ooh. So they, 
I was like, that is, that is, I was like, all right, PM, are you taking notes? Because we need to put this in the product. So not only were, were we there to help him so far, but now he's giving us great ideas of how we can help other customers with, how do you manage cost and performance? You know, we know that performance is great, and on the aggregate we help all costs, but even on the, how do you keep your users honest, mm -hmm. right? I thought it was great. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's such a departure from, I guess, my previous life before I joined Databricks. I'd write a silly query, it would go on for far too long, and then two days later, I'd get an email saying, what are you doing? And it's by that time, I've already spent all the money anyway. So, um, yeah, that is a much better approach, so. Fantastic, it's amazing. Out of curiosity, when you were working with this customer, uh, did they have sort of a defined, how, how, how long did it take for them to define this cost per user per day? Metric, was that something that they had created because they were working on this with you, or was it something that they already had from before? Great question. Started? Uh, so the way that they had analyzed costs, they, they came from another system before Databricks, and they were scaling up this product. They were growing with Databricks over the past like three, four years that Databricks SQL has been a product. Okay. Uh, so think like five, six years ago, they were struggling with these other data warehouses. They were doing a lot of DIY. And so the super engineering team, and they still wanted to over-engineer a lot of things, but we offer kind of like helping them make it simpler and simpler and simpler, but kind of, it, what was the question? <laughs> Just curious how long they've been looking at that metric. Because what Oh what yes, so, important. so when they came over from their previous system, they had this metric, and when they originally evaluated Databricks SQL Classic, that's the metric they used to evaluate us. So that, it actually came with but that metric has grown over time. So that's, that's how they evaluated us actually in the POC and they still use that metric. I actually think it's a pretty brilliant metric. No doubt. Uh, so yeah, I'm actually gonna probably, you know, help them write a blog to scale this out because I think it's a great way to uh, analyze costs. That's a great story. You mentioned a little bit in there about how, you know, they might have over-engineered a few things and it might need help simplifying. Um, I think we've all kind of come across this where it's kind of like, hey, it's really slow, and you look at it, you're like, oh, this is doing a lot of lifting that you didn't need to do. Um, what are some kind of telltale signs that maybe someone has mm, over-engineered or got a little bit too hard and kind of trying to make something better and it's actually been detrimental? What are the warning signs? Mm. Uh, the biggest one, the biggest foot gun that I've seen uh, uh, fired off, if you will, is uh, uh, we, we actually disallowed turning the auto stop on a serverless warehouse lower than five minutes in the UI, but you can actually go down to a minute in the API. But we did that on purpose because actually, if you have, it depends on what your queries look like, but if you have like densely, if you have dense amounts of queries that happen periodically, it could be good for that low of an auto terminate, but if you have kind of like sparsely populated queries, I'm sorry, if you have densely populated queries, that kind of, make, kind of makes sense if it's in spurts, but if you don't have spurts and it's consistent and you just have a gap of a minute and it has to come right back up in like two minutes or three minutes, like that type of down, up, down, up, down, up all day, people think, oh, it's going to be cheaper. Actually, it's not because there's warm up time and cash that happens. So like that's the biggest foot gun that I see is like people are super aggressive, they turn auto stop down, but like we do things to like keep the data fresh, the data hot in the background. Uh, and they're kind of like losing all of that benefit. So I would say being too aggressive with tuning the knobs. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Ali said in the keynote was we're, get, we're getting rid of the knobs with all the complete serverless version of Databricks. Uh, I think there's going to have to be some type of uh, bridge that, hey, you're going to have to trust us, like we're, pr we're using AI to tell the system how to better manage and scale and keep things on. Uh, with system tables keeping us honest and like showing the customer what we're doing on their behalf, I think we're going to get there, but we're going to have to build some trust. But you're always going to have a dichotomy of engineers thinking, you know, I want to over-engineer this problem versus I have to trust the vendor. I think it's on Databricks to actually build that trust to show you it. We're going to use AI, but here are our system tables. You can validate it. Maybe we can tweak things. But that's kind of what I see is like over-engineering a solution because just because they want to over-engineer it, I think is the biggest thing I have to overcome. I hear that. You know, one of the funny uh, things that came out of the hackathon we did on Monday was, uh, you know, the way we set up the hackathon, the way we staged it, we were giving people an introduction where if they never had a Databricks account, they were going to get onto serverless 
right out of the gate, first thing, and then they would just start on serverless and have that initial experience. And uh, we offered this to everyone who came to the hackathon, and some of these people were seasoned Databricks users. So they came and they were so accustomed to having the access to the knobs for spinning up a cluster, choosing the cluster size, choosing which runtime to run, and all those other bits that they were stymied by the onboarding flow that had none of those steps needed. You know, it was like, no, just get started and start opening the notebook and starting to execute code. And they were like, wait, where's the step where I make my cluster? And uh, so when you describe somebody who's like engineered themselves like mm -hmm. a, a solution and they're so accustomed to those knobs, I think the transition to serverless is going to have a little bit of that where, oddly enough, the people that are going to need the most education are the ones that have been database customers before as opposed to the ones that are coming on new. Yes. <laughs> No debate. Just no, yes. no, no joke. Uh, uh, I so we did the same thing for a data warehousing workshop that you all did for the Gen AI workshop, mm -hmm. and uh, I had spent a considerable amount of energy over the past three to six months, along with a lot of my colleagues, Shannon Barrow, Leo Mao. Thank you all for your help. Uh, but I, and as a team of Brixers, it's not just them. Shanku, Srini. Uh, there's tons of people. I could go on and on, but. We actually built this warehouse in a box workshop where we show you how to do all the ETL, how you can use data governance in Unity, how you use, use orchestration and workflows, how the serverless SQL warehouse is just there kind of doing everything. And the major feedback I heard was, I thought Databricks was more complicated than this. Lovely. So when, when it's, it's, so you, you're struggling with, I've got these data scientists who are like, where are my knobs? I got the data warehousing people being like, well, your competitors, that might have like snowy annotations or you know, come from uh, very old tech companies tell me that you're way more complicated than this. What's going on? And all I got to say to those people is we've got a great test drive at Databricks. You should definitely check it out. Test drive it for yourself. Yes. Don't believe what the hater is going to say. Uh, you should check it out for yourself. Uh, yeah, I mean, keeping Databricks single, or making Databricks more simple has been honestly uh, an absolute driving force for, gosh, Officially kind of two years, but I think maybe even more. I think we realized many, many years ago that, you know, the amount of knowledge that you had to have to kind of really tune a cluster and really tune Spark, like there's just not enough people on the planet who have that kind of knowledge and making something simpler is definitely the way to go. And I'm really happy to see how much fruit this is bearing now uh, to be able to give people the things that they want and not have to give them like, I don't know, a two week long course to get started with Databricks. I think we started in 2019, right? Around oh, the same time. Oh, together. yeah. Franco and I are like old school. Yeah, we started on the I same think, week. I think Ali was saying at CKO that year, we need to make Databricks, Databricks simple, not powerful. Mm -hmm. I remember it back then, right? And I think that now we've hired enough brilliant engineers and product people and acquired some amazing tech to make it truly simple. And I think now we're just really starting to see the compound nature of making it simple over all these times. I think now it's just apparent to everybody. Okay then, well thank you so much. What's wonderful closing notes. Uh, thank you Franco for joining us. Uh, and join us of, of, of our last guest after this section. <laughs>